This summer, members of the Green Party of England and Wales will be voting to elect new members of their executive. The executive of the Green Party is commonly known as GPEX. Now, members of GPEX are elected to specific portfolios, and today I'm going to be speaking to one of the candidates for the internal communications coordinator position. Before I introduce them, though, I just have one thing to ask of you, which is that you hit that scroll down right now and hit subscribe. So without further ado, I'll introduce the candidate that we have with us today, and we have an exciting job share candidate. So this candidate comes in the form of two human beings. So to introduce the first part of them, Alistair Finney Lubbock, it's an absolute pleasure to be joined by you today. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, really a uh, pleasure to be here and very excited to be on this ticket with uh, Laura as well. And beautifully introduced there by Alistair is Laura. Laura, how are you doing today? Hello. Yes, I'm doing really well. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here with Alistair. Fantastic. So uh, for viewers, I'm going to be asking a series of questions throughout and Alistair and Laura may choose to answer some of them or both of them may answer each of them. We'll see how it goes. But to start things off to both of you, um, whoever wants to answer, why are you standing to be the party's next internal communications coordinator? Uh, I'm happy to go for this. Um, uh, I want to see the Green Pipe become more effective at talking to itself and as a consequence of that being more effective at talking with the electorate and being more effective at achieving change and especially on uh, climate justice which we know is inextricably linked with social justice and that means getting more uh, Greens elected. Um, also having worked at the National Party and in the fundraising team I'm aware of some of the major challenges the party faces both in fundraising and how best to communicate with its uh, members. And having uh, worked as head of content for an international animal charity, I hope to bring some of that experience to the team and, um, and uh, uh, would like to also, in, in, in this vein, uh, encourage everybody watching to subscribe to this channel and support Bright Green as it's doing great um, internal uh, comms work. And as well as encouraging anyone who can, please, to increase your donations to the Green Party and to your local party so that we can keep the green wave uh, rolling. Um, promise Alistair is not on commission. Laura, was there anything you wanted to add? Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, so I would like to add that I know the Green Party has the best evidence based policies. There's wonderful people within the party and they're prepared to work hard and they, to make those policies real for communities. I want to facilitate the internal comms to become accessible to all and reduce the time required to access and share information. So as emerging issues present themselves, we seamlessly and coherently, whether it be to the press, political forums, organizations, or to individuals, we get that message out. I have received training from the party in a variety of comms and externally from Microsoft and charitable organizations such as Glitch, the RNIB. So I wish to draw on that experience and my experiences with the local party, Green Party women, election campaigns to galvanize us for, for a force for change in, the, in England and Wales. So I wanted to pick up on a few things that you kind of talked about there, but to start, to start off with, um, how do you think that the Green Party can improve its internal communications? Um, I'm happy to go first again on this one. Um, uh, I think there's a lot uh, of focus in the, in the party around like green spaces and, and on policy making, but I think we need to think quite holistically about member journeys um, and how people are communicated with and by at different levels. Um, and part of that is, you know, how we can integrate all of that better. So I'd like to look at the internal comm strategy and work with the staff who are delivering on that um, to make sure it's robust and innovative and listens to the needs of members and local parties, as well as the field team who do so much great work organizing uh, at that level to get people elected. So uh, I think we have begun to make far better standards for ourselves in terms of accessible fonts and tools as standard. I want to continue to improve and upskill us so all of our internal comms leads by example and creates an external impression of what I know we all feel is important as a party, which is inclusion. Action Network and other software we use has the capabilities to be more engaging to a variety of communication needs. Let's get our self-competence across the board utilising them. And so one of the areas that um, I think I don't think it'd be uncharitable to say that there's perhaps some um, uh, difficulties when it comes to internal communications within the party is the understanding that members have 
of the work of GPEX. I think if you were to ask most members of the party, firstly, what GPEX is, secondly, who sits on it, and thirdly, what it does, I think if you were, generally speaking, you would get uh, a confused look and very little in the way of uh, knowledge and understanding. Now, the internal communications coordinator, part of its role is to uh, facilitate better communication between the executive and the membership and the work the executive is doing. How do you think that uh, you'd be able to deliver that? Um Yes, um, so obviously, as I previously stated, um, making uh, any communication more accessible means that people will receive information in a way that they can process and understand. I think we often use things, words like GPEX instead of saying the executive um, because um, it's easier for us to communicate that way, but actually it mystifies um, and removes uh, the ability for people to uh, grasp it within their linguistic language. Um, so yeah, I think um, we need to be approachable. We need to be able to be people that people see as the face of, of, of the party, as well as the face as somebody that they could approach to, whether we're at a, a, a day, uh, an event, um, and to ask questions and to really reassure people that there are no silly questions we are open and happy to discuss things. I think it also goes back to what I was saying before around having that idea of the full supporter journey. Not everyone, when they first join the party, when they're interested in, uh, you know, the green issues on a national level, will be interested in the sort of minutiae of, of how we organise at the executive level. Um, so it's about working out where people come into that journey and where they are on, on, that, on that path um, and where they need to you know, speak with their local party where and make sure there's lots of information available there if, if they're interested or um, if they want to come, you know, via national levels and, and, and get more information through that. And then obviously also being a, a presence at a conference and when, you know, being able to explain to people kind of face to face when they're at that level of engagement. So one of the areas that you touched on earlier was around fundraising. And just to let viewers know, um, the internal communications coordinator is one of the positions on GPEX that has sort of oversight of the party's fundraising work and sits on the development committee and other bodies which are responsible for uh, overseeing the staff fundraising operation. Now, fundraising has always been a challenge for the Green Party. And I think, you know, the, the political ambitions that the party has don't always get matched up with the <laughs> amount of resource that is needed to deliver them. As internal communications coordinator, um, how would you ensure the party can deliver an effective fundraising strategy that means that it has the funds uh, to fight the election campaigns that it wants to? So when I was working at the National Party, um, uh, well, the Central Party, uh, I was in the fundraising team and uh, at the time um, there was a, a, I was in a general election and I was running for uh, the parliamentary seat in, uh, in Hackney North um, and I had to come into the party doing events uh, work um, and then they sort of sidestepped me into the fundraising team where I hadn't really been before and then the other fundraising uh, person had left so suddenly I was alone doing all the fundraising for the national election and I was very proud to you know we raised a quarter of a million pounds in that election uh, primarily off the back of a fundraiser but also doing that kind of major donor fundraising um, but I, I got to see all of the all of the big challenges you know obviously we're very strict with ourselves about the ethical nature of the money that we want to come in and that's difficult when a lot of the system uh, you know people who are um, you know high net worth individuals as they're called um, are are you know using tax havens and things like this, um, and it makes it very difficult for the for the party to do that ethical fundraising. So um, I think it's it's really important that we just make sure we use as much best practice as there is out there, you know, from the charity sector, from from other sectors uh, around how we um, engage, especially the membership, to have that grassroots fundraising, um, and and how we can um, help local parties to do fundraising from from their side of it as well. Um, I know from doing local party uh, phone banks and things like that, people are happy to be asked, you know, can you give a little bit of extra money to, to the local party? And if you can illustrate the, the difference that that's making at a local level, um, people, people are keen to, to, to continue to support that. 
Yeah, you so, understand anything you want to add? <laughs> so I just want to um, say that I'm very glad that Alistair has such an extensive experience. Mine's far more local in terms of phone banking, um, but on a, on a more personal level, I've been a lone parent for 14 years and anybody that knows what it's like doing that knows that you've got to be very uh, sharp and, and you know, uh, a keen eye on how to be inventive with money. Um, so I kind of have a more uh, uh, sort of practical uh, level of that, but I am willing to draw on Alistair's experience. Brilliant. So um, I want to ask you some questions now about um, some of the kind of broader issues in the party and on GPEX, because obviously you're standing for an individual position, but you would hold the responsibilities if you were elected of the whole of the executive. And there's a bunch of kind of key things that um, I'm trying to ask all the candidates, whatever position they're standing in about. The first of them is around transphobia. So I think it'd be difficult to be a member of the Green Party for the last few years and not to have recognized and understood that there's a ongoing problem with transphobia within the Green Party. Now, I want to put to all the candidates and ask them what you personally think that you would be able to do as a member of the executive to help challenge and stamp out transphobia within the Green Party. Uh, so thank you for asking. Uh, it's a really important subject. So um, firstly, solidarity with our trans members and those experience transphobia on an increasingly organized scale. Um, I'm really proud of our trans inclusive policies um, and I stood on Green Party Women Committee to promote the inclusion of all non-binary and women that fall within the feminist banner, including trans women. I think we need to promote and support our trans members to hold positions within the party that underscore our commitment to equality, equity and inclusion, whilst our external comms should make clear that transphobia is not welcome within us and it is not welcome around us. I also locally have supported uh, the first Church of Pride and have been an active participant in fundraising and promoting events that. So um, on a personal level, I wish to make strides where I can and I invite people to join me in doing so. Uh, I'd like to add that also I mean, I'm really proud of our trans inclusive policies and I think we need to make it clear that there's no place for transphobia in the party. Um, you know, we need to refute all aspects of culture wars and focus on advocating for our good progressive policies. Um, and for those who are opposed to trans rights, who hopefully are just at the beginning of their journey of learning, we need to show them how those sort of fears are, are baseless. Um, our trans and non-binary siblings are here to stay, especially now that they're facing these attacks from all sides, we need to show up and practice solidarity. Um, in Hackney, I was really pleased with uh, my uh, councillor colleague Zoe Garbit to introduce uh, or, or to, to work with them on uh, a motion. And we also worked with um, the, the Labour Party within um, Hackney. So we had this joint motion, which was really good and, and really showed that, you know, across the political spectrum, we need to be um, very, very um, uh, clear about our position. So we had this uh, motion supporting uh, trans rights. And, and that was what, again, a really proud moment in my first year of being a councillor. So one of the other areas um, that I think it's important to ask all the candidates about at the moment is... Um, the party's finances. So obviously we touched on it before around fundraising, but the executive is the body within the party that is responsible for the kind of overall financial management of um, the party, its financial well-being, and so on. Um, so I wanted to ask you what your kind of experience is of dealing with and handling uh, large, complicated, difficult budgets. So from, from my side of things as a councillor, I interrogate the council's budget and um, uh, and I work as, at an organisation which is essentially a workers' co-op, so I have responsibility for the budget there as well. Um, uh, but my focus is going to be really strongly on the sort of fundraising and development, because you know, to if we've got a, a leaky bucket, that's that's kind of what we need to address. So making sure that there's really good retention. That's also part of the engaging members piece, and that's a big part of what we need to do. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's where I'll be best uh, bring my expertise to bear. Uh, so, as I previously mentioned, uh, I've been a lone parent for 14 years and budgeting a household with medical costs uh, on a very, very tight budget has meant I've, I have extensive experience of how to get the most cost effective results without losing sight of the requirements necessary to thrive. Um, I haven't got so much experience on a wider scale, but Alistair uh, clearly does. So uh, I'm going to draw on his experience and hopefully work as a team uh, to achieve that. 
So the last of my sort of serious questions before I finish on my slightly less serious ones, which I like to, um, is around the party's political strategy. Um, so the party obviously has huge electoral ambitions over the next few years. As a member of GPEX, um, you know, GPEX is one of the two primary governing bodies in the party, along with GPRC, the Green Party Regional Council, that has um, that, that, that works to steer the party's political objectives and strategy. Um, you know, you're standing for that office. What do you think are the big things the party needs to do right now to achieve its political ambitions and political strategy? Um, so I'm going to go first here because I'm very, very passionate about this. Um, uh, I think one of the uh, key areas in which we need to, uh, and all in all areas of politics actually, you need to really push to strive for, is the fact that um, we're still underrepresenting uh, women and non-binary persons within the party. Um, I think that we have an untapped resource where people do not feel capable or confident enough to put themselves forwards. So we need to be engaging those people, making them realise that they are the future of the party and that we will be stronger and better with them. Um, I do a lot of work with Green Party Women uh, to promote that and have engaged in a lot of external organisations. So I've sort of drawn on that information and will continue to, uh, to strive for that. Yeah, I also think that, you know, we need to really work hard to support the work of the field team and make sure that our sort of elections infrastructure is uh, is really well bedded and, um, you know, consistent across across the whole of uh, England and Wales. Um, I also agree that, you know, we, we have some representation issues that, that desperately need addressing. Um, and that was also, you know, in terms of race, I think we need to see more um, Greens of colour pushed, you know, and, 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 and enabled to, to step forward and, and be at the forefront of our, our politics. And um, I've sort of helped with that a little bit when I was working at the Green Party, working closely with the Green Colours Chair at the time, Samir Jaraj, she's also a Hackney Green member here in, uh, in Hackney, um, to help launch the Deak and Zerabi Fund. Um, and so I sort of did that initial fundraising campaign. I was really proud of, of doing that and then now seeing it sort of come into fruition and uh, um, start helping people to, to, to promote those voices. So now, as promised, going to move on to my slightly less serious questions. Uh, the first of which, and I'm going to put this one to Laura first and then Alistair, is what is your favourite and least favourite Green Party policy? Oh, good question. Uh, so um, I've got a couple that I want to sprinkle in here as well, because I absolutely love universal basic income and our four day working week because they are social justice policies. And I can see a really big difference being made in terms of social inequality um so that, yay for them um but my particular favorite one is uh our drugs policy i'm on the drugs policy working group uh have been to westminster uh with uh, other local uh london members um to push for a change in our drugs laws uh, they're over 50 years old they're not fit for purpose they people are dying literally because of the current drugs laws um, so uh, I used to be a mental health nurse as well, so I've seen uh, the outcomes um, and could see the potential in, in what we're striving for. So I'm very excited and would love more people to shout from the rooftops about how great that policy is. Now, on terms of my least favourite, uh, I did an online test before I joined the Green Party and it told me I was in alignment with 98% of the Green Party policy. And I've spent the last few years trying to find that 2%, but I've yet to find it. So I, you'll be the first person to know when I do, um, but as of yet, I have none. Yeah, um, I, 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 find, I find this question really hard. I, again, I really love all the policies. Uh, I think we've got great education policies, abolishing SATs and Ofsted and getting rid of tax exemptions for private schools. I think, you know, really important democratic reforms like PR and getting rid of the House of Lords and the monarchy, a piece of security ones like scrapping Trident nuclear weapons, you know, that's such a, a massive waste of money. You know, obviously our trans rights policy, migration policies, tax reforms, and yeah, the, the, the drug reforms as well, I think are really good. And, 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 and similarly, you know, I can hardly think of a single, you know, policy that I'm, I'm not a fan of I sort of googled you know what, what's the worst Green Party policies and the Spectator article come, came up and it did a list and I was like these are all great these are all bangers. <laughs> Excellent well on my next question I'm hoping I can pin you down to just one uh, I'm gonna go to Alistair first on this one and it's what book has most inspired your politics? Um, I would say probably um, the Prison Notebooks uh, by Gramsci. 
Um, I think those writings on the media are really powerful and you know, really interested in the media. A lot of my background is, is about media and obviously now um, sort of social media and, and new medias. Um, and I think all of the things that he wrote about were really applicable to the really applicable to media landscape, even though it's changed and a lot of those power structures behind them are still are still there. So mine's uh, mine's the uh, my year two uh, degree study book, uh, which was biogeochemistry, um, which most people probably wouldn't associate immediately with politics, um, but it was a study of where biology intersects with geology and chemistry. So uh, spending a year not sleeping, learning this information, uh, I realised that the scientific data was there. Uh, but the political will was the thing that was lacking. Uh, so that's what's driven me into politics. Um, and yes, I'm so glad that that book and that information was presented to me in the way it was. Amazing. Two very different texts there, but vital nonetheless. Uh, Laura, to kick us off, if you were Prime Minister for one day, what <laughs> one policy would you change? Oh, oh um, if I was Prime Minister for one day... Um, I would, I think I would, having recently been on a, an abortion rights march, I would shore up the remaining half of the drink that hasn't been drunk in celebration of um, making it a healthcare issue um, and not a, a, a legal issue. Um, yes, that's my most current thing. I think um, if I was Prime Minister for a day, uh, I'd get the ball rolling on a lot of nationalisation. Um, bring bring the railways back, bring the water back, bring the energy back, all of those. I think that's really vital and probably you probably could get started on that in one day. Definitely get started. A very busy day, but I'm sure you could get started. Um, <laughs> Alistair, who is your favourite historical figure? Um, I try not to idolise my idols, but... Um, Erico Malatesta is pretty good. His sort of anarcho-socialist thinking is something that, you know, really inspires and guides me. But um, also, you know, the Deca Nazarabi Fund was, was set up because, you know, Deca, as when he was running for mayor of, of Manchester, um, sadly passed away. Um, and so when I was learning about him and how you know, the work he was doing at a local level, he was a community minded poet and he spoke from the heart about being the change you want to see. I bet I think it really inspired me. So my answer, uh, uh, as a rule, I answer this question that every woman that stood before me to foster a world where I can be in front of you to promote creating space for others and to be able to raise others up are the people that inspire me. And then finally, start with you, Laura, who in the Green Party inspires you the most? Who in the Green Party inspires me the most? Um, Gosh, I, uh, so many people. That's, that's a really tough one to answer because there's so many people. Um, well, so I met Carla, um, our co-leader at uh, campaign school and realizing that somebody could be approachable, um, interested in the individual, but pushing for our wider scale changes, it, it really galvanized my um, sort of enthusiasm for getting more involved in the party. So I'd have to say Carla. Um, I would say it's, it's just the really amazing members and organizers in my local party. Like they inspired me to get active and to, and they were all working right super hard every day to further that green agenda locally and nationally and there's also some really amazing staff members who are really passionate and professional and keeping the party running so yeah combination of those not not one I'm afraid that's the end of my questions Alistair and Laura thank you so much for joining me today thank you thank you for having us so that is the third of my interviews with the candidates in this year's GPEC selections. I just have a few final things to ask of you before you all leave. The first of them is to scroll down right now and hit subscribe because that way you won't miss out on all of the other interviews that we're putting out with the candidates this year. Whilst you're there, let us know what you thought about that conversation in the comments as well. And if you are able to, please do head to bright-green.org forward slash donate so that you can fund these interviews and all the rest of the content that Bright Green puts out. So that's all for today. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you all very, very soon.